building a new life in Men Don't Leave. Bigoted Bob Hoskins is haunted by the ghost of Denzel Washington in Heart Condition. And Bette Midler dreams of a better life for her daughter in Stella. It's all coming up next on Cisco and Ebert. plays a put-upon mother sacrificing herself for her daughter's happiness in Stella. One of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. Other stars in this week's movies include Jessica Lange and Dennis Hopper. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is named Stella, and it's a tearjerker, a great tearjerker with a big heart, starring Bette Midler as a working-class mother who has a child out of wedlock and raises her on her own. As the movie opens, Midler is a barmaid, and the baby's father is a medical student. When they learn that she's pregnant, the future doctor, played by Stephen Collins, makes a half-hearted proposal of marriage, but Midler is an independent woman who's determined to work things out on her own. Yeah. Come on, you don't want to marry me. I don't want to marry you either. <laughs> Look at you, trying so hard. <laughs> All the time you're thinking, oh my God, I gotta marry a, a pregnant bartender who quit school in the 10th grade. The daughter is played with great spirit and conviction by Trini Alvarado, as in this scene where malicious rumors cause her friends to stay away from her birthday party. I mean, if they don't want to come to my party, I can deal with that. This is Midler's finest moment in the movie. She goes to talk with the fiancé of her daughter's father to ask them to take the girl because they can give her advantages that Midler can't. And so if you and Stephen was to get married and she was to come and live with you, you could probably adopt her. And the two of you have the same last name. And everybody would just, just naturally think she was yours. And that's Marcia Mason as the fiance. Now, it would be easy to sneer at Stella, I suppose, and adopt the attitude that this is a cornball, predictable melodrama. But movie material is only as good or as bad as the style in which it's realized. And Stella is a movie with a lot of style, warmth, and heart. It has a quality a lot of more sophisticated films lack, which is that it makes us really care about the characters. The Bette Midler performance, out on a limb and filled with energy, is what really carries things along. But Trini Alvarado is wonderful too and all of the performances in the movie find the right tone to engage us emotionally this movie was inspired by the 1937 barbara stanwyck classic stella dallas and the film historian leslie hallowell said of that movie that audiences came to sneer and stayed to weep the same thing may happen this time uh, i came to uh, weep and sneered uh, I, we have a wildly big difference of opinion on this picture. Yeah. I, I really was unhappy watching all of this, and I was almost embarrassed for the people in the picture. Uh, I didn't buy a single character. They all seemed very contemporary, but Midler seemed very contemporary. Trini Alvarado particularly seemed like a high-energy, attractive young woman of the late 80s or uh -huh. early 90s. And in this picture, it's all photographed and stylized as some kind of 50s or 40s melodrama, and I didn't think it worked. I never believed that Stephen Collins would be the least interested in Bette Midler. I don't understand why they got married in the first place. They didn't get I married. I mean, the, why they had yeah. a relationship in the first place. It, none, none of it worked. Well, Gene, to some degree, I think you have to be a little bit forthcoming when you come to a movie like this. This is a tearjerker, weepy melodrama. That's what it is. That's I wanted it to be there. The people in it are very likable. The situation is not believable. It's not supposed to be believable. It's supposed to be manipulative. Either you're going to go with it and allow it to have this effect on you or not. Now, I love these people. I thought Midler's performance had so much, it had a flair to it. I mean, the timing, the, the way she carried herself, the way she 
talk. She seems like she's role-playing some Xerox, pale Xerox copy of Stella Dallas, the old 40s heroine mm. who's going to be plucky and survive. I don't know. I, know, I, I one thing I do not do. One thing I do not do ever, so I'm going to break my own rule and do it right now, is I never review the audience. Right. I'm going to tell you, when I saw this movie at a sneak preview, everybody in the theater was blowing their noses, honking. Well, there's a lot of flu going around. Hands. A lot of flu going around. Oh, gee, now, come on. Now, no, no, people I mean, I heard were really emotionally... I'm not going to retreat into the audience. I laughed at the okay, picture. Well, I, and I heard okay, some Okay, well, echoes. I had a great time, and you caught flu. Next film. Our next film is called Heart Condition, and it's a real shock to watch because it wastes the talents of two of the best actors of recent years, Bob Hoskins and Denzel Washington. These are actors who previously have almost always guaranteed adventurous films, but not this time. Heart Condition turns out to be yet another body switch movie. We really needed another one of those. This time placing the heart of a black man into the body of a bigoted white detective. Bob Hoskins from Who Framed Roger Rabbit plays the detective who requires a heart transplant to save him from the effects of his bad diet. Denzel Washington from The Mighty Quinn and Glory stars as the ghost of the lawyer who was murdered and whose donated heart saved Hoskins. Only Hoskins now can see Washington. Don't you listen to the doctor. Don't you know what the doctor does? Look, you're looking very stupid now. You are dancing with a cheeseburger. <laughs> Soon Denzel Washington explains what happened to his body to an incredulous Hoskins. I mean, one minute I'm sitting in the front seat of my car and I'm dying. Next thing I know, boom, I'm standing in the operating room looking at myself while they're pulling my heart out of me. I mean, it was the like fine actress Chloe Webb from Sid and Nancy is wasted in the role of the prostitute girlfriend of Hoskins who holds the key to the murder of Denzel Washington. I don't know why I keep forgetting to drop this off. What a waste of great talent. The script doesn't try anything dangerous, like having nothing change in the white man's behavior with his new heart and the black man be frustrated that there is no change. The script also is an uncomfortable mix at times between a strong thriller about cops and prostitutes that might have been interesting if they had just simply removed this business of the heart switch. And it's a silly slapstick comedy also about wildly different buddies. Let's go one way or the other with this picture. I just feel so angry about the failure of heart condition because it probably means that these three talents actors will never work together again. I agree with you totally on this movie. The thing that really confused me was that it was all over the map in terms of tone. There are scenes here that could belong in a little whimsical fantasy. There are scenes here that belong in some of the roughest, toughest mm -hmm. cop movies we've ever seen. Including I would have liked that, to see that, that villain who's going to kill or control people by giving them overdoses of drug shot into their veins. That's a little bit heavy right. for a flighty fantasy about a body switch. And as for the insights into the fact that uh, uh, the cop is a racist and now he has the heart of a black man and the ghost follows him around everywhere. There weren't any real insights into black-white behavior here. It was just all stereotypes in which people behave in expected ways and they react in expected ways. It was a complete uh, miscalculation uh, from beginning to end. Uh, it, and it would be just another bad movie if that were the only thing. But when you have superior oh, acting yeah, talent yeah. and you're seeing Hoskins mm -hmm. and you're seeing Washington and Chloe Webb, uh, then you say, oh my gosh, they're really blowing it. And then you start to question, why did they pick this picture? I mean, was it for money or what? I mean, it's just goofy. Well, maybe, you know, why does anybody pick any picture? Because they think it's going to be good. And that's where we come And sometimes money. I should have picked a different one. When we come back, Jessica Lange stars in Men Don't Leave, the story of a young widow facing life on her own. Mrs. McCauley. I know you're going through some personal problems. You are my right? problem. His name Men Don't Leave, and it stars Jessica Lang as a happily married woman with two sons. One day her husband is killed in an accident, and so she's left to raise the boys as best she can. She sells their small town house, moves to the big city of Baltimore, and gets a job with a gourmet delicatessen. Of course, the big question is, will she find a new man in her life? And the answer is, of course she will. He's a musician, and they have a meet cute when she drops lunch all over the floor. Uh, we're playing here Friday night. It's a very weird program. Do you like weird music? Yes. Good. Bring a boyfriend or a husband or whatever. And afterwards, we'll get together and all throw food on the floor. That's Arliss Howard experiencing love at first sight. Lang's older son, played by Chris O'Donnell, soon starts a strange relationship with a somewhat older woman who lives in the same Baltimore high-rise. She's played by Joan Cusack, whose performance is one of the best things in the film. Are you a nurse? No, but I help people. 
Lang disapproves of this relationship, but despairs of controlling her family in the strange new city environment. I really don't want you in my house if you can't treat us with some degree of courtesy. You know, I don't know what your story is, but why don't you hit the streets and find a nice little ten-year-old, and then you can really go to town. Meanwhile, Lang's own relationship with the musician is on again, off again. I like you. I like to be close to you. If it can't be physical, let's go bowling. There are actually certain similarities between Men Don't Leave and Stella. Both of them are manipulative tearjerkers, but while Stella has the courage to admit it and to go for it, Men Don't Leave is all cluttered up with the debris of unnecessary realism. It pretends to be a lot more sophisticated than it really is willing to be. Jessica Lange is actually very likable in this movie, but the screenplay is a mess. A thicket of false starts and dead ends, and the movie's unconvincing happy ending feels like it got that way only because they left out about three crucial scenes at at the conclusion of the film. Among the many questions I have about this movie are, I doubt if a fourth grader could ride his bicycle and hop a freight train out of Baltimore and wind up in a small town a two hour drive away. I doubt that hot air balloon rides are an instant cure for manic depression. And I also doubt that many women in this predicament will be able to find a man who is infinitely gentle, understanding, laid back, and saintly. I just find that hard to believe. Well, this is sort of classic. We gotta just preserve this show. If only to say, I declare that this is the good, really fine movie and that Stella is worthless. You're joking. That is exactly the way I saw these two pictures. If they're gonna, if people are ever gonna, you know, they always wanna know about our relationship and what we are like. Look at these two pictures and see what you think. Then that's what we're really like, because because this picture to me is lifelike. This is tough. Uh, it is. It is. There's a heartbreaking scene where the little, the older boy, the 17-year-old, uh, wants that man to come back into his mother's life, and it's a beautiful scene. I defy you to to not be emotionally moved by that scene. In fact, I'm going to ask you: Were you not emotionally moved by that scene where he pleads for his for the guy to come back and be friends with his mom? I like that scene. All right, that's a good yeah, scene. I did like that scene. But Gene, just a second now. Yeah. Here's the problem here. You say this movie is realistic. I say Stella and this movie are equally, equally manipulative and artificial, but that Stella has the honesty to say, I heard you say that. that it is a tearjerker. This movie, which pretends to be the sociological study of this person, is more of a fantasy, really, than Stella. I mean, mm. come on, this is the unmarried woman syndrome again, where the woman is alone, and who does she meet? The greatest guy in the world, you know? And he's except, understanding, except, and he's there for her, and he's always just perfect. I, I, I'm surprised you couldn't see them, you know, pushing your buttons all during the movie. I was enjoying uh, the, the story. Your which buttons I, pushed. No, no, because I didn't expect in this kind of story to find the Joan Cusack character. I didn't expect to but find... What happens at wait the a end? second. Can, I didn't you even, can you even tell me what happens at the end of this movie? Oh, life goes on. And life boy, goes that's on. exactly what Does happens. She, do, do they get the money from the uh, from the lottery or not? Is she really the no. partner of that woman no. in the bakery? Where'd she get her new clothes? Where'd she get her hairdo? Does she even have a job? She's going to have a job. You don't know job. any of that She's going to have a job. There are scenes missing right you don't and know, left. Roger, you don't know what is going to happen in the future. What about her depression? That's it? You have a deep depression, you She's go on a hot air balloon and the depression goes away? She's going to have a depression this, later. Gene, this movie was just as much a soap opera as not the other one. Just not honest no, enough no, no. to say so. No, I, I think it's not even the same kind of soap opera. I think this is a, a patches of realism and wild well, comedy right, then, directed then. by the guy who did Risky Business and it's another good film. Real Paul disappointment Brickman. for Paul I Brickman. like this picture okay, a lot. I did. Coming up next, Dennis Hopper has some fun with his 60s hippie image in flashback, the story of a 60s prankster coming out of hiding and confronting the 80s. You like me, but you won't admit it. Flashback, and it's a close call for me. I like the performances more than the story, which is about a 60s hippie prankster coming out of hiding in the 80s and blowing the mind of a very uptight 1980s FBI agent assigned to transport him by train to prison. Dennis Hopper is well cast as Huey Walker, the Abby Hoffman like character, here an uneasy rider on the train with the agent played by Kiefer Sutherland. 60s are over, Huey. Times have changed. They passed you by. We can't all be flower children for the rest of our lives, you know. But we don't have to be in such an all-fired hurry to grow up, either. We could have a little fun first. So far, so good. Great casting. But the story gets too broad in its humor when Hopper, now disguised as an FBI agent after breaking free from Sutherland, is captured by a couple of former hippies angry at the feds for harassing the legendary Huey Walker. They don't realize they're talking to him. And you two guys are going to be doing the hot squats if you don't release the... <laughs> 
And the movie wanders over familiar territory when Hopper visits an older hippie, played by Carol Kane, living alone in a commune. Lately, I've been dreaming about microwave ovens and automatic food processors. Think that means that I sold out? Flashback is enjoyable because of Dennis Hopper's great charm as a rascal and Kiefer Sutherland's excellent work as a straight arrow. But the movie doesn't take us anywhere fresh before we get the predictable finale involving a change of heart. The script could use less action, less farce, and more closely observed behavior of these two very different personalities. When they're alone together, I think Flashback does work. But they're not alone together enough for me to vote thumbs up. Well, this was a close call for me too, and I am giving a thumbs up, and I'll tell you why. At the beginning of the movie, when you had uh, Sutherland and Hopper together, it looked to me like it was gonna be a retread of Midnight Run, you know, where the two people are on the train together and they're gonna talk to each other and That's one will talk the other one out of and so forth. It looked like a formula picture. What I liked is apparently the part you didn't like, where they break through the formula by coming up, first of all, with that crooked sheriff who's running for office, and then I enjoyed the fact that two uh, hippies from the 60s uh, would run into this guy and he's still their hero and so even though they're now middle class guys they're going to try to help him out a little bit and I also enjoyed the whole flashback to the 60s in terms of that commune and the Carol King character I liked all of that because it contrasted the values of the 60s with the values of the late 80s and I enjoyed it I also feel that Dennis Hopper's performance all by itself is enough to get your thumb above the horizontal. Uh, uh, I thought that it was very predictable that we would get the older hippie thing. I mean, that part of me, I think I've seen that before. And I, there was one other picture where you meet the old hippie. I can't remember the, the name of it uh, a couple months ago. So that I expected to see. I like these two guys. That's the part that uh -huh, is exciting. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Kiefer Sutherland does not overplay his hand. I mean, he uh -huh. really plays the character with, with a vengeance, uh, just as tough as uh, Hopper does. I mean, if you want to see Dennis Hopper's performance in the picture, that's, you're not going to have a bad time. Unfortunately, it isn't supported by enough. When we come back, Cinema Paradiso, the story of a small town where a small theater represented the magical world of the movies. Charmer, a movie called Cinema Paradiso that takes place in the late 40s and early 50s in Sicily and is mostly set inside a small town's only movie theater. The movie stars that sad-faced actor Philip Noiré as the projectionist in the theater and young Salvatore Cassio as Toto, a local boy. Every week when the new movie arrives in town, it's censored by the village priest who rings a bell at every shot that must be clipped out of the film. <laughs> The projectionist is a little bemused by the boy's love of the cinema and teaches him how to run the projector. Cinema Paradiso was directed by Giuseppe Tornatori and it won the special jury prize at last year's Cannes Film Festival. It tells several stories. One is the story of how movies completely dominated the imagination of their fans in the days before television. Another one is the way that movie theaters attracted all kinds of strange customers from diehard film fanatics to couples who only wanted to kiss in the back row. And the third story is the way that projectionist becomes a surrogate father for the young boy whose own father was killed in the war. Cinema Paradiso invokes and recreates the whole magic of the movies, not only in this small town in Sicily, but in any small town. In fact, watching this movie reminded me a lot of the Saturday matinees at the Princess Theater on Main Street in my hometown of Urbana, Illinois. The, the whole ambiance was, was very nostalgic for it. It has the magic of the movies, and so it, you, you think of pictures like Day for Night with Truffaut's tribute to movie making and to the world of movies. I think of Fellini's autobiographical films, most personal films, and talking about in, in the mix of characters all coming together in one little square, and this time to be enclosed uh, at a time. It's a beautiful story, and it doesn't have a conventional ending. I expected it to end a couple of times, and it kept rolling on and rolling on, and I enjoyed it. I, I wanted to know more and have the story updated as it, it goes along. I thought it was just terrific. It's a big epic You know, among other picture. things, I think, especially in Italy, where little theaters have really been killed by television and by home video, uh, it's an elegy to a lost time. Sure. Because in small towns, not only in Italy, but all over America, the
the theater was where people got together and their dreams were on the screen. And because they were there in the theater together, sharing these dreams, it helped make a commonality of what they were afraid of, what they were hopeful of, and things like this. Now, when everybody is kind of in front of their own television set all by yeah. themselves, it's kind of lonely when you laugh. There's nobody to hear you when you're laughing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's mournful when you see uh, he, he visits the thing not being destroyed, and there's a, a little freeze of plaster from the projection uh, booth, uh -huh. and uh, there's cobwebs in it, and it, something has been lost in it's American It's a very movies. sweet, it's a very nice film. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. A big disagreement on Stella, the weeper starring Bette Midler. I didn't believe a minute of it. The actors seem much too contemporary for the old-fashioned cornball story. Roger loved the whole thing. Two thumbs down for Heart Condition, the heart transplant comedy that also wanted to be a tough thriller. Another big disagreement on Men Don't Leave with Jessica Lange as a widowed mother. Roger thought the film had too many loose ends, but I really liked its unpredictable quality, bright writing, and comic weirdness. Another split vote on Flashback. We both enjoyed Dennis Hopper's performance. I just found more flaws with the rest of the movie than Roger did. And two more thumbs up for Cinema Paradiso. An elegy for a time when movie going was a communal joy, and I really recommend Men Don't Leave. I think and it's a I good film. And I recommend Stella, and it's a total, complete, basic, fundamental difference between right. the two of us. You bet. And you know, if anybody sees both movies, I'd like to hear from them. Right care of your local station. I'd like to see what's in the mail. Well, we both know that they'll see one good movie. Okay, <laughs> that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with Stanley and Ira, starring Jane Fonda as a bakery worker who falls in love with Robert De Niro, and Luce Cannon, starring Gene Hackman and Dan Aykroyd. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. <laughs> You can win a submarine in the Nestle Crunch Hunt for Red October sweepstakes and watch for the major motion picture starring Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin. rice a -roni, the San Francisco treat. Now with 30 flavors, you can serve it every day for a month and never serve the same dish twice. Redkin Classics, hair care products formulated to create beautiful, healthy hair. So effective, their formulas transcend time. Available exclusively at salons. Magla latex rubber gloves with absorbent lining, non-slip grip. Protection for all household chores. From Magla Home Helpers.